morning to everybody on this uh, Sunday morning. Just some update from the congregation. Bob Young, who we said last week had had a stroke, he had the clot removed. He's recovering at Interbeni Hospital. There's movement in his left side. The doctors are positive, and we thank God uh, for Bob and continue to pray for him and are grateful that he is improving, and we think of Peggy as well in the family at this time. Uh, other good news is that um, uh, Charles Hayden has returned from New Zealand. He's in quarantine now at Eden uh, Crest, where he lives, and uh, he continues to make progress. It is the first Sunday of the month, and so we, uh, we're going to have a little communion service. You may want to pause the YouTube at this stage just to go and get some, uh, some grape juice and bread so that you can take part with uh, Debbie and I. But we're going to do the communion service, and then after that, we'll do our Bible reading and our little message for today. So, as we come to the communion service, let me read a prayer that we will be reading uh, this morning. Merciful Lord, we do not dare to come to your table, trusting in our righteousness, but only in your great mercy. We are not fit to gather up the crumbs under your table, but your mercy is everlasting. Grant, therefore, that we may eat and drink by faith, to be united to him and he to us. Hear us, merciful Father, and grant that we, receiving this bread and communion wine, in accordance with your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ's holy institution, to remember his death and suffering, may share in his most blessed body and blood, who on the night that he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, and in remembrance of me. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith and with thanksgiving. The blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was shed for you, drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Almighty God, we bring you praise and thanksgiving and ourselves, our souls and bodies to be a lifelong offering to you. Lord, accept this duty and service we owe you, not because we deserve it, but because of Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name alone we come to you. Amen. And now we're going to turn to our Bibles, to Luke chapter 12 and reading from verse 22. And um, while you maybe are just looking that up in your own Bible, I, can't, I couldn't help sharing this with you about the breaking news. You know, swimming pools to reopen, but due to continued social distancing rules, there'll be no water in lanes 2, 4, and 6. Well, I found that a bit, a bit of cheer. Now, here we are in Luke chapter 12, and reading from verse 22, it's all about worry, and I've called... Uh, our topic this morning, Coping with COVID, and it's all about worry. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life and what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothes. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? And since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? Or consider how the wild, wild flowers grow. They do not labor or spin. And yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, how much more will he clothe you, you of little faith? 
And do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after such things, and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. We'll read so far just for the moment. I guess it goes without saying that everybody worries about something. And especially during these days of COVID-19, worry is very much part and parcel of life. Surveys done show that the three greatest worries in life, starting with number three, number three is money. The second greatest worry is our personal health. And our greatest worry is children, whether it be our own children or grandchildren, perhaps even the lack of children. We worry about how they're getting on, whether they're happy, whether they've got friends and jobs, whether we're failing them as parents, whether they might get sick or get kidnapped or die in a terrible car accident. All right, well, just when you thought the church was meant to be encouraging and uplifting. What is certainly true is that more days are lost at work through stress-related illness than ever before. More people are receiving therapy than ever before. More tranquilizers and antidepressants are being prescribed than ever before. And then Jesus comes along and he says, do not worry about your life. Do not be anxious about your life. Now, usually if someone were to say that to you, uh, you may say in response to them, or if you don't say it, you'll certainly think it, that they don't understand the pressures that you are under. But in the case of Jesus, these are not the words of some unsympathetic religious guru who lived a long time ago. As we read in the Gospels, which are the biographies of Jesus, we quickly realize that he faced enormous pressure in his short life. And yet he was the most loving and compassionate person that you will ever meet. And so here in Luke chapter 12, it gives us two very helpful doses of medicine to help us live without worry. Number one, don't worry. Remember who meets your needs. Jesus is telling us that there's no need to worry because we have a Father in heaven who knows what we need and he cares for and meets our needs. And the rest of what Jesus says here shows us that we can have complete confidence, complete trust in our Heavenly Father's care. Now he gives a couple of examples. I'll just use the first one in verse 24. Consider the ravens. They do not sow or reap. They have no storeroom or barn, and yet God feeds them. And how much more valuable you are than birds. Now, you won't find that kind of advice in any self-help book. Get out your binoculars and go out bird watching. Now, of course, the birds do have to work for their food. They're always pecking away, but... They're not stressed out and spending their time working every hour to make sure they've got a pension plan or worried that they saved up enough for a rainy day. And so here's the point that Jesus is making. If God cares and provides for them, how much more will he care and provide for you and me if you and I will turn to him? Because you are way more valuable to him than the birds are. It's the same argument with the flowers, the wild flowers in the field. Some translations call it the lilies uh, in verse 27. Now, all of this isn't a promise that for those who trust God, life will just automatically be trouble free. But it is a promise that through all of life's circumstances, that God will indeed provide. That your Father in heaven is always looking after you, even in times when that doesn't seem to be the case. And Jesus is really asking us this question. Is that how you see God as your heavenly father who loves you, who takes care of you? Or do you think that he may neglect you or that he may fail you or that in some way he may take advantage of you? And the root problem, the root of our worries and concerns is that we are, we are suspicious of God. And so we kind of move him out of the picture and try to handle all of life's difficulties on our own. But what if God is incredibly good, better than we could ever understand or imagine? What if God loves us so much that he sent that which was most precious to him and most important to him, that is Jesus, to die on the cross for us? 
And of course, that is the case. And that's what Jesus is saying to us, that God is unbelievably good. So you don't need to worry. That's the main point that he's making. Now, secondly, don't worry. Remember who's in control. Let me read on a little bit from verse 31. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be given to you as well. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. Don't worry, but remember who's in control. Now, Jesus says here that we are like, little, like a little flock of lambs, which at first sight doesn't seem to be too complimentary. But he's, what, he, what he's really saying is that when God looks at us, he sees a group of baby lambs who are often vulnerable, afraid. Uh, they often are prone to wander and go astray. Uh, and he looks after them. Now, he's not saying, don't worry, there's nothing to fear. He's not saying, don't worry, just be tough and you'll be fine. But what he is saying is, don't worry, because you have a father who happens to be the king of the whole world. He's happy to put all the resources of his kingdom at your disposal. And so you can rest assured that when trouble comes, that if you turn to him, you will be fine. And so... If we were to get right to the heart of the matter and to the heart of God's answer for worry, the trouble is that we get so caught up thinking about ourselves and putting ourselves first and trying to think that we can control the world and we can control our circumstances and we think that if we turn our circumstances over in our minds over and over again, uh, that somehow we'll solve the problem. And of course we can't. Only God is in control. Only God can transform the course of our lives. He's the king. Nothing is too big a problem for God to be able to, to deal with. And so Jesus is really saying to us, stop gazing at your fears. Stop, possess, stop obsessing about them. Look at your father. Seek him. Put him and his plans first because his plans are bigger than your fears and my fears. And so we need to let go of our anxiety and we need to do that by passing it over to God. And that's why in another part of the Bible, the Apostle Paul says this in Philippians chapter 4, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And so next time when you're lying awake at night and you're worrying how everything's going to work out and how you're going to fit, fit everything in, well then rather focus on God. Switch on the light, read some verses like the ones that I've just read, hand it over to Him. He's in control of everything and turn to God and pray about how God can meet our needs and overcome our worries. There's a third and final piece of advice. I'll be very brief here. And that is Jesus tells us in verses 33 and 34 that part of the antidote to worry is that we should be generous. He says in verse 33, sell your possessions, give to the poor, provide purses for yourselves that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will never fail where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be as well and as i read those verses you're saying to yourself my goodness me peter what are you saying that the answer to worry involves me giving away my money you've got to be kidding me if i were to give away all my money my cares and worries will just multiply and get even worse but when jesus says these words he means that god isn't taking our stuff he's taking our stress because he knows that there is great joy in being generous Great joy. It reorientates our minds and our hearts and our eyes away from ourselves. It liberates us from being so self-absorbed that worry can cripple and choke us. It allows us to love others and it allows us to get to know God uh, better. Because God himself is a giver by nature. He's given us everything we need, not least his son Jesus Christ. And as we give, we walk in his footsteps and we discover the true meaning of life. Don't worry, says Jesus. Remember who meets your needs. Don't worry, says Jesus. Remember who is in control. And so let's pray together. Father, help us to turn our cares and worries, and we know there are many of these during these 
times in which we live, unprecedented times. Lord, we've never been through this in our lives prior to this. But yet, one thing has never changed, that you are the king, that you're in charge, you're in control, we have a relationship with you, and help us to give our cares and worries over to you. Even this day we pray it, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.